All right, everybody, this is Chris with Drop Dice. So um, <laughs> I made the video on Thursday and kind of talked about some things, and it got me, uh, I guess, my juice is going for putting out some more content. So tonight's video, albeit it is on Saturday, is not actually my official uh, Community Saturday video. This is more of a random thought thing. If, um, if I ever feel the need to do just a random video, I'm probably going to label it as just random thoughts and create its own playlist. Um, basically what I want to talk about is personalizing your campaigns or making the campaigns unique to each game. Um, this is something that I've started, well, I used to do a lot more face-to-face -face games, but I've started figuring out tricks that you can do um, for, for in-game on computer use. Uh, let me switch my screens real quick here. All right, so... Um, one of the things that you can do, very simple, you've seen a lot of this, is these overlays right here. Um, they're pretty easy to set up. You do it in Photoshop. You create a PNG, and you'll put your name on the lower portion or the upper portion, however you want to do it. And then you can put your channel logo or whatever you want on there as well. Um, here's a couple more examples. Let me show you real quick here. Let's switch over. So here is the generic Hangout Toolbox one. Um, for a character I made named Shikoba that was a ranger. Um, and then a couple of defaulted ones. Not a big deal. Um, this one I did originally because I didn't quite understand that it needed to be uh, a PNG, and I was getting irritated with it trying to make it match up, but there's Knobfang Grimstab, my shaman. Um, <laughs> we made him for a... Um, a monstrous races kind of cobalt, or rather go goblin-themed game, and it was a lot of fun. Um, let's see, here is, nope, not that one. Here is one of the ones that I, I started using for a uh, Pathfinder game for Rylamus Arvel, one of my characters there. This one was a really easy workup, and basically I just kind of dropped in the image I wanted on there, and then I just kind of um, put it inside, and you can see that I have some spots that are right here in this, this area where it's a little window. Um, stuff like that is kind of cool to play with and manipulate. Um, as I've gone along, I've produced more. Uh, here's Ingvar, similar format. And then, uh, let's see, this is one of the newer ones. Uh, Xanthor, my Minotaur from uh, Shadowrun. And inside this one, you can see that I've got a icon of the character over here, and then over here I've got the Shadowrun icon, along with my name and the, uh, the character's name on there. Uh, that game doesn't get aired. I just felt like putting one together to kind of practice. And then uh, you guys may have seen this one earlier today. If you caught the Viking game on Jarl GM's channel with Cirque Bastard Born, uh, my uh, Jarl, jo Jarl Jotun, sorry, Harl Jotun uh, paladin of, uh, of Vengeance. So... The overlays are kind of a cool thing you can play with. It's very easy to work with. Um, inside this video, I'll link over to Jarl GM. He did a fairly good tutorial showing you how to do it. Um, there's a couple things you can do in Photoshop to kind of improve what you what he's kind of touched upon, but I think his is a great basis of where to start. Um, one of the things you can do is you can actually like um, defringe the image, and it looks a little cleaner when you do that, which I'll show you guys here in a little bit. Okay, let me shift you back to my second monitor real quick because I wanted to have that in front of me. So um, this video, like the previous set that I've been doing, we're going to share screens for a little bit here. And I'm going to talk to you about how I like to customize things for my games. So let's kind of start off here with screen one and share this one here. All right, perfect. So a lot of the stuff I actually set up today, that way I'm not digging around too much. Um, I want to show you guys this first. This is a, um, a hero point, obviously, uh, and it tells you what the hero point can do on the back side of it. I haven't done this before. I was looking for um, Savage Worlds has, has bennies inside them, and essentially it's a lot of stuff like this where they're uh, – there it goes – where it kind of oh, – those are knockdown chips. That's a little bit different, but essentially um, Savage Worlds bennies – are stuff like this where it's like a little poker chip and it usually has something to do with the game. Um, that is something that I used to do and found a lot of enjoyment from. Um, 
Let me see if I can find some cool custom bennies to let you guys see what these kind of things kind of look like. But this uh, this token right here is kind of a good example. Again, this is a superhero version of that hero point, which is the same one we saw earlier. Uh, let me pull that one back up here if I can find it. Here we go. Because there was another thing I wanted to show you. So there's that one. There's the superhero one. And then this is another idea that I hadn't done um, myself, but um, putting the potions and things like that on poker chips. Now, if you get yourself a cheap set of poker chips, you can just kind of glue these things right on top of your poker chips. Or if you happen to be on an online game, you can actually plug these things in uh, to your computer and kind of put out your own version of, uh, of bennies or whatever they're called for your game, hero points or, or whatever the case may be. Let me see if I can pull some up here. So these are the default Shadow or Savage Worlds ones. Um, there's different games like the Savage Worlds Solomon Kane, and these are some kind of personalized ones to that. Um, I really love the idea of using personalized ones. Um, this is kind of something that you see a lot of people do where they'll use like bottle caps and stuff like that. I think that's kind of a cool idea too. Um, let's see here. Here's some Ghostbusters ones. So there's a lot of fun stuff you can do. Like imagine if you were playing a Ghostbusters game and you came to the table and these were your bennies. That's going to increase your player buy-in, and I think it's a great little thing. Like if you look, these are just cheap plastic tokens that they glued a Ghostbusters token on or emblem on. Um, here's another one with like a little bit nicer poker chip. Uh, this one looks like it might have been printed on, and there are websites that you can go to to get custom printed poker chips. Um, this is one I've seen before using um, using uh, runic stones or farth to uh, fark farth i'm probably saying that wrong uh norse rune stones for bennies um let's see here and then you see a lot of people especially with savage worlds where they'll have like a clean poker box like this savage worlds does happen to use a deck of cards and um poker chips as kind of its basic premise and it does kind of feel a little poker like when you're playing because you're you're basically betting to get better odds and things like that during the game. It's it's a neat game if you haven't tried it. And it does kind of reinforce this idea of having handouts and things like that. Here's... Like, here's an okay example here. I'm trying to find somebody who's got a very good setup. Um, I helped out with uh, one of the guys from the Savage, Savage Worlds GM Hangout with his game. He did a superhero game, and we found... Uh, some tokens that had onomatopoeias uh, from from like old comic books where they were like bang, zoom, zap, things like that. Uh, and then he used a deck of cards that were from, uh, I believe it was it was a Marvel or an X Men specific. I'm not sure which one it was exactly, but it was a deck of cards that was personalized to it. Um, so that's that's actually one of the really cool things that um, they really encourage in that and. For whatever reason, I'm, not, I'm having a hard time finding a great example of it. But um, so, how this translates to to your your digital content? Now, I've made mention that I use uh, Roll Twenty before, so I'm going to pull up Roll Twenty again. Um, this is how I've used it. So, in Savage Worlds, they've got the the bennies or the hero points, whatever you want to call them. So, what I did for this game is. Instead of being poker chips, because I wanted the world to have kind of this, um, it was it was kind of designed with a Game of Thrones feel. Um, so they have things like the adventure deck and the the playing cards that you use for normal drawing and the, the bennies themselves. So for the bennies, I wanted to keep it with this kind of a, a natural feel. So I made them benny stones. So let me show those real quick here. If you notice, I've got a little deck here. Then I'm going to show my adventure deck and my playing cards. If you notice, my adventure deck has the real hero of Game of Thrones, Hodor. And then I've got the Iron Throne as my playing cards here. Um, so basically, when players are told that they can get a Benny, you can just drag it out here. You can drop it directly on the map, and they'll see what that side of the Benny does. Um, so let me recall this one real quick. I'll show you guys something real quick here. So with bennies, so let me pull up my sheet here. Unfortunately, this game actually moved away from Savage Worlds. We were originally doing it in Savage Worlds, and we decided to switch over to 5th edition to try it. 
I think I may have archived that handout. Let me see here. Here we go, Benny Stones. Let's restore that real quick here. Just so I can show you that real quick. Mm -mm -mm. Chaos Stones, Bennies. So if you notice, each one of these has a different color. Um, that's actually Savage World specific. I took that totally from Deadlands with multiple colors and things like that. Um, but basically, my players can pull those, and when they throw them down, let's say they get this one, and that's a green one, which means that they can do anything that the blue one can do, um, but can be used to offer benefits to another PC. The GM does not get to draw regardless of use. Um, with the blue and the reds, the GM gets to draw. So that's something that you can enter, enter into your games, having these kind of custom-looking things. Uh, let me show you real quick here. Uh, this is not what I was looking for. Uh, this is fairly close. So here's the original images I used for them. Um, let me drag this one over. So here's my, my rock. I just found a PNG of a rock, and then I added a little... Um, like a, a magic rune crest thing that I found in a, paint, in a Photoshop paintbrush set. Um, and I basically set those up for everything. So um, all I did, let's bring up a Photoshop document. Now, if you notice, I've got a whole bunch of different assets inside there. Um, basically, I kind of collect them up, and then I see which ones I want to use. So basically, I made one document. I threw the rock in there, and then... I saved one with this layer on, and then I turned off that layer and saved one with this layer on. And it was super easy to kind of crank these things out once I had kind of the baseline. And that's kind of the trick to doing any of this custom content is setting up the baseline material. Um, let's go ahead and minimize that for now. So now the, the reason I wanted to bring this up is, let me pull something real quick here, because I want to talk to you about uh, character sheets. We're going to go to Savage Worlds again because they do have some custom sheets. Um, but I want to show you some generics here first so you guys can really see. So this is uh, one of the Savage Worlds Explorer character sheets. Um, this is kind of a straightforward one. Here's another kind of straightforward character sheet for Savage Worlds. But then if you look, you've got some cool ones out there. Like, uh, here's a Star Wars one where it's kind of personalized and it does have that great feel. Like, looking at your sheet, you already know that you're going into Star Wars and it's going to feel a little bit more uh, like a, a game that you would expect it to. Uh, let's see here. Let's find another one. So this one is for A Song of Fire and Ice. The picture apparently is going to be real faded. Uh, it looks like it's probably a little better on your screen than it is even on mine, but it's it's pretty crummy picture, uh, just to be straightforward. But this one, it, it's got like some imagery in the background, and it kind of it it's kind of gives you the feeling of it. Here's another one that's for Deadlands, and it gives you the idea of you having uh, your sheriff's badge, and it shows you how your ability scores actually go into this star. You've seen it a million times with other games, um, but I, I find that having a character sheet that's specific for that game really increases player buy-in because they're going to see stuff that that's only important to that game. Like, here's a cool one for Cthulhu Tech. It's kind of a futuristic Cthulhu game with, where they use mecha and stuff like that, and these little octagons kind of reinforce that, these little punctuated lines here. Um, and that'll, that'll definitely help out uh, for... For these games, unfortunately, with the way Roll20 works, unless you happen to be really good at CC co or CSS content and uh, HTML content, it's kind of hard to make your own character sheets. But if you check out, let's pull up, I'll pull up Sean here. Roll20 will show up with the character sheets, and then you can actually click on this icon, and it makes that its own pop-out, and you can move that around. And I can actually take it entirely off the screen, which you guys can't see because it's on my screen number two now. But this one's kind of cool. Um, we were using it for 5th edition. It's been working out okay for us. Uh, the rolls are sometimes a little wonky because every time they update Roll20, it sometimes ends up tearing apart character sheets. And so as far as how they roll inside the, the, the chat log, they do, however, uh, store the information without any problems. So that's, that's not really a big deal there. Let me... Hmm. Here it is. Okay, so 
this is kind of your straightforward character sheet. It's it's fine and dandy and all, but what's really cool is when you have players bring forward something along the lines of this. Um, I had a I had a friend who uh, wanted to do an Eberron game and do it in Savage Worlds, and so he didn't have a character sheet and asked around if anybody had anything. And uh, me being the person I am, I like to do stuff, so I started putting together a Savage Worlds character sheet for him. Um, I do everything in Photoshop, so there is a Photoshop document, but these are basically my image files to kind of show what it is. So let me pull this up here. Uh, you guys will recognize that octagon pattern. That's what I used for that little nameplate there. But if you check it out, there's an ammunition track here. There's all the stuff that you'd expect from Savage Worlds. And then I've added this repeating octagon pattern just because I think um, Eberron's got kind of a, a quasi-futuristic feel to it, so I thought that was pretty cool to have inside there. Um, unfortunately, when I share a screen, I can't actually change these things. Let me see. There we go. Uh, so here was one of my character concepts. I actually have the Eberron map on the background, and it just looked kind of busy, so I decided not to go with that. And this is what the final one ended up looking like, which is that one with the image. But if you go through here, I've got all of it. It's very just a generic character sheet, but it's got some nice touches that make it feel like Eberron. And this is one of the things, the, uh, the dragon marks. I made a page for each dragon mark. Uh, the aberrant mark is kind of special and it doesn't actually have any sort of like marks that are found on the wiki. But what I did is like for the mark of deception, I grabbed this off the wiki and then I added each one of what that mark looks like at each tier. And so they get to put in what their bonuses are and things like that. And then I've got the mark of finding and it goes all the way through the different dragon marks that are available in Eberron. And it was just a little personalized touch, but it was kind of cool to be able to do that um, to get kind of more personalized look. If you look at this folder, you're going to see that I have just a ton of assets floating around in here. Um, that tends to happen when you create some custom content. Um, just keep in mind that you'll probably have to squirrel away some pictures and things like that so that you can come up with something that, uh, that works for you. Uh, and then what I ended up doing, I, I showed it to everybody on... Uh, on the community as well, but I ended up producing this. Um, actually, I should have opened it with this. This um, this PDF document here, where I just kind of uh, put it together and had it all in one place for anybody who wanted to play the game. Um, that's pretty easy to do. You can actually do it with InDesign if you have access to that. If not, there's a couple other programs that'll let you take um, JPEGs and turn them into PDFs, but then those are usually done sheet by sheet, so you may want to look for another alternative. Uh, let's take a look at... Oop, looks like my InDesign finally opened up here. InDesign's kind of cool because it's what you use to lay out things like magazines and like that, and so if you ever want to set up a PDF document, uh, InDesign's pretty cool for doing that which, oh, it looks like I did this one as a trial. Yep. So my, uh, my time with InDesign has expired. But if you decide that you want to try InDesign, it's, it's like a 30-day trial, and you can try it for free. There's probably some other free programs out there that do the same thing. I just don't use it that often that I've looked for any sort of alternative. All right, so let's go ahead and exit out of that. And keeping with character sheets. I want to bring these up. Uh, some of you guys may have seen these floating around. I'll pull up one of them. Uh, I really like the way 4th edition did theirs. Um, their pre-gens. Uh, this is my 5th edition version. Let me pull up a 4th edition one. So fourth edition created this thing. Uh, they called it like their one pages or one one page character sheets. Um, so let's check this guy out here. Like if you look at these, uh, that one's not the official one. That one's a template somebody put together. Uh, let's see here. This guy's an official. So this is one of the D and D encounter ones, where he kind of has the picture here. It fades over and it talks about all their abilities and things like that. I, I thought these character sheets were, were super cool. I liked the idea of them. Um, so I wanted to create something for the Copper Jackals group that was similar, um, just for me to be able to stretch some Photoshop skills. Um, 
like here was here was kind of a strong example of what I was going for. Um, mine are kind of like dossier entries. They're not a hundred percent um effective like you can't just use that sheet unfortunately i mean i'm sure if i cleaned it up i could get it where it looks a little bit more like this and it could be used just as the image itself which i may do in the future but for now what i've got going is this little dossier entry uh this is marcus north he's my character um i went ahead and started putting these on deviant art so that everybody could see them at their full resolution because i was doing it at 300 ppi um Facebook kind of crapped on my resolution and made them look pretty bad. So, uh, like, this is how I put it together for 5th edition, and I may end up changing this. Again, It's it was kind of more of an experiment to have some fun with it. And from what I'm getting as far as feedback, a lot of people are really liking these. Um, so, like, I did stuff like I started with um, an image for the character, and then I turned it into the character sheet or their one sheet here. It was totally fun, and the cool thing about this is once I've set up a template, let me pull this up here. Now that I've got this template, all I really need to do is change this image in the background, which is this layer right here. I just turn that off. I put in a new image, and then I set the gradient over, and then I adjust all these numbers and change the colors to be appropriate. It's pretty easy once I've got that template set up. Again, 90% of your work when coming up with this custom content is going to be prepping it right up front. Um, if anybody is interested in finding out how to do this or getting a, uh, a copy of the PDF uh, so that they have a template for it, let me know and uh, I'll see what I can do for you. Um, I'm probably going to tweak it until I feel a little bit more uh, comfortable or happy with the way it looks before I necessarily share it with everybody. Let's go ahead and close this one out too. So that was kind of a cool thing here is to be able to put together these one sheets. Um, I, I'm doing them without any sort of real cost or anything. And once you figure out how to do the, the overlays, this stuff kind of comes pretty easy because it's a similar way to do it. Um, this is not my character, but I want to show you this one real quick. Let me pull up Garhaltz. So Garhaltz is kind of unique because I have two images and I got to adjust the way that the, uh, the imagery works inside there. But I want to show you real quick basically how this stuff goes. So you've got your basic image. One of the cool things to look, or one of the important things to look for is if you look at this image, there's a little bit of hard line on the outside. That makes it really easy to extract that image from everything else. So let's go over here. Um, because that hard line exists, you can just use your magic wand. And then you can click out there, and it's got everything done and highlighted. You're going to have a couple white spaces in here, which you can take care of just by clicking inside of them. And that'll actually select them, too. Mm, that looks good enough. And then... Control shift i will reverse that, and then if you have something like this where it's a template, you can just come down to the page where the image is, click on that, and then you can do a switch over to your, to your um, transform tool, and then you hold shift and you'll click on it, and you'll pick it up. And if you notice, it's going to leave a, a silhouette there. If you take it over to the next document, you just drop it there, and then boom, it's right there. All you have to do is resize it, play with some filters, and then you've got it in place. Super easy, like I said, once that template is done. So let's just delete that, and then I will close both of these out. And the cool thing is if you move your picture between documents like I showed you there, um, that silhouette goes away and the image is back. It just creates a, a copy of it. Um, let's take a look here. So there is that. And I, I thought that this was really cool because I thought, you know, What's, what's a better way to get into some sort of pre-generated character or even have a character that you like um, than to have this, this just solid custom character sheet here? Now, there's tons of examples. Um, this one is the one that I just happen to like, but let's take a look here. So here's some custom character sheets. This one I love. Uh, the guy who did this one did an awesome job. He wanted to have like an Assassin's Creed look. So he found an image that worked and kind of played with it, adjusted his background, and he's even got like an Eldritch Blade, and he's got the hit point box track that matches up with the Assassin's Creed games. Um, 
but each box is five points, so I feel like this one was probably more for aesthetic choices, why he did that, because um, these diamonds being worth five points each makes it seem a little bit hard to track hit points. Um, just because if I deal 13 points of damage, you're going to color some of this box in? I don't know. Um, it would it would probably make more sense if you made it into fours and gave them split like that, and that way you could fill in the corners. I don't know, personal choice, but um, this is kind of one of those ideas that I said that I was saying that that looks really cool, and especially because you can do this stuff, and it looks awesome when you display it on a website. Um, this may not be the best for an at table game. For an at table game, you may want to consider something more along the lines of like like these sheets where the background has been customized, but there's still spaces where you can definitely write in. Um, here's a good example where you have a good solid picture like that, and then it um, it goes in from there. Uh, let me see here. I love Dungeon World, and there's actually an, a person on Google that shared ones that he was doing. Let's see, here's another good example. Um, same basic premise style. I think this might be from the same guy. Um, but I mean, this is this is basically following that same diamond pattern idea using the hit point track it, here. I wonder if that's a typo. This one says 48 there. But essentially, if you look, what he did is he adjusted kind of this to match up with this character's motif and feel. There's um, little flourishes inside here that reinforce this image. And then if you notice, there's um, both his name written and then his name signed here. Those are really nice touches. Um, I think that it works, like I said, best on like a website. If you're going to show your game um, or your content to, to anybody who's viewing or anything like that. Um, here's another good example. Uh, it looks like this is kind of a mercenary game and they've got their character sheet and some dog tags over here. That's, that's, pro that's a good example of something that you could do. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Let me see if I can find those dungeon world ones. Cause I think the dungeon world ones are awesome. Um, basically the guys, the GM and his wife who happens to be good at, um, art, put these sheets together. character books and you wish I could remember his name that way I could just find him for you guys on here so this is kind of similar this isn't the one that I was talking about but if you look um, Dungeon World uses playbooks essentially they're little pamphlets that you give everybody and they have all the instructions you need inside there which is why I like Dungeon World and Apocalypse World. But essentially, they've got some custom art on the cover of it, so you know who's who. Um, but you get the idea. You know, custom custom sheets really increase buy-in, and, you know, if you do happen to have that skill or one of your players happens to have that skill, it's really awesome to have this character sheet. That no matter how the game goes, you're going to be able to walk away with and have that as kind of a souvenir of the game. Um, if you do bennies, and maybe at the end of your campaign you give out those bennies as like a as a as a thanks for playing type thing. Like maybe you give everybody one benny to keep. Um, you know, if you plan on running that that world again, um, I think little little handouts and things like that really kind of kind of reinforce the idea of what the game is and how much fun it is playing these games. Um, here's some scout books that were done customized. Um, and I think that that's something that that we don't really see a lot of on the digital content just because of the limitation inside there, which is why things like these little Benny Stones and my adventure deck, the adventure deck is is basically just the regular Savage Worlds adventure deck, except for I put Hodor on the back. That little touch right there, just having Hodor on there, uh, my players really like that. Um, same with the Iron Throne. I, it's just a regular deck of cards. That's actually really good for Savage Worlds to draw that Joker. But it's just a regular deck of cards inside there, but I changed the backs of it to match up with it. Um, again, the importance of you know having a custom world map, things like that. Um, I talked about it last time. Some of these some of these images I put together, like the bear's tongue in here, uh, which is a pun. Enjoy that. Uh, I put together this map, and then I pulled some elements from Roll Twenty, like these tables and things like that, and solidified them on the map layer. 
Um, just little stuff like that can really change how the world works and how people see it and enjoy it. Um, that's, that's something you can do from the digital content side. A little bit more towards the table side for the last time here is um, miniatures. I like Reaper minis. Um, I think they're built really well. There's there's tons of other uh, miniatures that are out there, but I, for whatever reason, I've really liked Reaper minis. Let's pull up some from... Hmm. Let's go to the Warlord series. Look at some elves. I think I think they they come out with some really good ones. Like check out this one, uh, the Elven Musician. It's got like a weird trumpet tuba thing, maybe. Uh, little co little things like that. It, again, if you happen to have somebody who's artistically minded in your group uh, that that doesn't mind doing that sort of thing, maybe you guys get together, buy them some paints and some brushes if they don't have it. That way, they can put out some custom minis for you. Um, on the flip side of that, let's go back to back to uh, you know digital content. So here we got kind of lazy and we just put pictures on our character sheets. But the cool thing is, is if you have a character sheet, like let's say um, we'll go back to Sean. If you notice on his bio, his character sheet character picture is his token picture. So if I want to change this to be something that's a little bit more token like, I can definitely do that. Um, Let's go ahead and pull up this last bit here. I've got these pictures that I use for token rings. Um, let's make a, hmm, let's do a sci-fi character. So open that with Photoshop. And again, I've got these things kind of preset. Once you find some stuff you like, then you can definitely use that. Let's see, Shadowrun uh, Street Samurai. See what we can find for images. So just for convenience, let's go ahead and pick out something that's easy to work with. Try to find a good one here with some easy background so I can show you what we were talking about before. Of course I won't, because, you know, that'd be easy. Uh, yeah, let's let's grab this guy who looks atrocious. Let's save this image here, and um, I'm just going to save myself some time and drop it inside my tokens folder here. Then I'll come back over to tokens, pull this guy up, open it up with Photoshop. If you notice, I saved it as a JPEG. That's not a huge deal. What you can do is take your select tool, select the amount of the image that you want to use. So let's say I want to go with this. If you hold shift, you'll get a square, a squared off image. Um, and then I will create a copy with control C, drop it in over here. And then what I'm going to do is go ahead and zoom in. And let's just delete all that white space. And then now if you notice, I've got some image carryover right here and here. Let's just get an eraser. Control D to unselect. It is not showing up here. Oh, there it goes. So let's go ahead and erase that out of there. So now I've got this clean image. Um, what you can do is, like, let's say, you know, you want to give it a background, and we'll say we'll give it a blue background just for convenience here. We'll do that. And then pull this token and put it on top. And then the cool thing you can do is, let's play with it a little. Take this image, the transform tool. Size it up. Got it a good size. So 
So that looks pretty good. And then what I want to do is just eliminate that stuff on the outside. This kind of goes back to that little trick I was showing you before. Just highlight everything that's outside, and you can take that out. Um, so that's not 100% perfect, but it's definitely a good place to start. And then what you can do is, now that you got that, go ahead and deselect, take your eraser, and you can just cut right into that and eliminate all that stuff you don't need. Let's increase that eraser size so that this goes a little faster. And there we go. We've got a functioning token. Let me save this, and then we'll get rocking and rolling with it. So let's see, save as. Um, you can save it as a Photoshop document if you want to keep the format there in case you're going to do multiple tokens. But again, we're going to do it as a PNG. That way the, this clear part stays clear, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't create any sort of white background there. So let's say call him. Street Sammy. Go ahead and leave the interlaced on none. So now I've got this, this cheesy samurai token. Let's throw him inside the game. So we'll add a character. And then for his picture, go into my token folder, pull it up here. If you use Roll20, it is best that your, your token image, if you're going to make tokens like this, remains a square shape because it's going to fit to a grid in most cases. So now I've got this awesome little guy here, which we're going to call Street Sammy. That's his official name. And let's say I'm going to play him. Uh, I've named myself Drama Mancer just because I thought it was funny. And then uh, let's go ahead and save the changes here. So here is my character sheet for Street Sammy. When it comes time to throw him on the map, I just drag him out there, and boom, he's got this huge oversized token right now, which if you're doing Theater of the Mind, that really doesn't matter, but let's say you're you're doing a dungeon, and you need to size him down to an appropriate size where he's similar to other characters. There he is. Um, the cool thing about this ring that I chose here is you can do stuff like, um, so this green color, maybe green is for PCs, and then if you notice, I've got red. Maybe the red is for NPCs or bad, like NPCs with malintents. And I've got blue, which is maybe NPCs that are neutral or good intentioned. Um, I like having multiple um, rings just because it does have kind of options available for you. So I've got like the Skyrim rings, which are here, um, which I've got kind of the standard token. I've got a gold one. I've got. Uh, the bronze one, which is a little bit different stylization to it. And I think having three of them is kind of a good feel because then you get your PCs, your malintents, and your neutrals or, or good aligned NPCs. Um, it's kind of like when you play a video game. Now, if you happen to be playing a, a game where someone's intentions should not necessarily be known up front, I would suggest putting those as blue rings until you've dis until at least the players have discovered that they are malintents or malfactors, and then go ahead and move them over to the red ring if you want to. Um, I'm lazy, so I would probably just keep them on a blue ring. Uh, just kind of your choice there. For the example of like the Street Sammy token here, let's go ahead and close that out here. So once that is out there, what you can do is, again, back to our dungeon. I can just take Street Sammy here, throw him down on the map, and if you notice, because he's square, he fits right into the map, and I can move him around. Now, we talked about dynamic lighting. If you do happen to do this, it's really easy to set up. You just come in here, and you will go to the Advanced tab, and then you can do Emits Light. So let's say I want him to emit one unit of light and it's going to be light radius and start of dim. So let's say I want him to have six units, and he's going to start dimming at three units. He's going to have sight, and I'm going to say all players can see his light. So now once I've done that, there it goes. It quickly adjusted, and if you notice, I've got my other token that's on the map, which let's zoom, change the scale here. I've got my Angus token way over here who's emitting light, and I've got my Street Sammy token over here who's emitting light. And if I move 
Street Sammy around, you can see where his shadows are. And um, this is kind of the cool thing about having multiple players. If I have one player kind of scouting ahead or falling behind, their light will show appropriately as multiple light sources within the game. Really cool. Um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about uh, this time around because you know it's it's one of those things that if you do take the time to do some custom content, it uh, it it definitely helps out. Now let me go ahead and. So let me stop this real quick here. All right, so it looks like I got a comment from Tabletop J Gaming with Juice. Uh, yeah, I was doing a live hangout, and at the time you, when you dropped in, it looks like it was um, talking about some custom character sheets. Um, if you get a chance to check out the whole video, Juice, uh, it is about overall just custom content in general. Okay. Um, so... The other thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, Fantasy Grounds. If you do happen to have access to Fantasy Grounds uh, or have seen anything about Fantasy Grounds, I really like the look of it. It is a little expensive, just to throw that out there for anybody who's thinking about that. Um, but if you if you do invest in it, I think the I think the format is actually a lot nicer look than Roll Twenty is. So. I'm not going to share screen with it because I don't have any. I'd just be pulling up Google images anyways. But um, if you guys do get a chance to check it out, um, let me see. Daryl on Facebook. Let me see what his full name is here. Daryl Simmons um, on Facebook happens to run out of Fantasy Grounds almost explicitly. Um, you can. He's usually got his games open to where you can check out what he's been playing and stuff like that. And uh, what's what's really cool about Fantasy Grounds is the way that the interface works. I think it's it's pretty neat. Um, I do have some kind of kind of questions about how people use content. Um, like, for example, I get a lot of people who tell me that they use um, they use like um, sorry, not not Skype, but um, you can you can definitely use Skype, um, but they'll use stuff like uh, another voice service instead of using Roll 20s built-in voice service, which seems a little silly to me, um, unless you're recording the games. Because right now Roll 20 doesn't have an option to be able to let you record, so it makes sense to actually do um, a Google and broadcast, and then if you're going to use Roll 20 elements, use the application for Roll 20 in Google. Um, but like a lot of people have told me that they use um, push to talk features and stuff like that with other programs. I'm totally spacing and forgetting what that's called, but you guys know what it is. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things that you know if you if you're going by what somebody has told you in the past, a lot of these programs have been getting updates and they've been changing pretty rapidly over the past few years. Um, like at one point, I could see using a different program for Roll Twenty, but now they've changed around some of their some of their stuff, and they actually work really well. I run exclusively out of Roll Twenty now um, for my normal campaign. However, um, depending on how they feel, like I said, when we start L Five R, that may or may not be shown publicly. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about was just the uh, just the fact that. Uh, you know, doing some custom content like that will change the dynamic and increase your player buy-in. Um, and plus, if you do some of those things, like let's say you do digital versions, at the end of the campaign, like I was saying, you could hand out your bennies to your players for, for keeps. You could actually make real mock-ups of those things. Um, or maybe if you want to be an awesome GM that, who happens to be artistic or something like that, and you want to make some figurines for them, um, or maybe at the end of the game, give them a scroll that says, like, thank you from the people of Greenwood for saving us from the elder beast of, of Bane's Keep, or whatever the case may be. Something like that that your players can hang on to would be kind of cool. Um, it doesn't have to be anything super duper crazy, but, you know, a little bit of extra in there would definitely be impressive. I, I would like it if a GM did that for me. Um, it's something that I've started doing, but I, I don't see a lot of. Um, and I think that's mainly because a lot of online stuff does happen to be one shots or temporary base. Um, I'd like to see more people coming out with with more campaigns and more solid base type line things um, where they where they do focus on kind of the fundamentals of the game. Um, 
that's pretty much what I got for for this video. Uh, as far as any sort of updates, if you guys have not checked out the Horns of Serenos game on Jarl GM's channel, make sure you do. It was a lot of fun playing that one. Um, and the Fate game, uh, me and Spider are mates. That one was totally awesome. Uh, I think I might try doing Fate at some point myself. Um, I'll probably try and play it a couple times before I go and run it, but it, it looks looks pretty easy to pick up and fun to play. Um, next week on Friday, uh, I on the let me just double check the date there. On Friday the 29th will be my Souls of Steel game, uh, at least the first portion. Um, right now I'm at two players. If you are interested in playing that, go join the Facebook Tabletop One Shot group, which I'll link inside the comments below. And then you can join the uh, Souls of Steel game from there, uh, which will be under the events page. I'm going to put up another little um, kind of blurbage to remind people, because I set it up about two weeks ago. And I know for some people that's hard to plan out that far. Um, but I would like to see some some more friendly faces on the on my my first game for the channel here. All right, guys, uh, that is it for this video. Thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you at the gaming table.